Thank you everyone for joining us tonight um, for this wonderful webinar. Um, Blue Hair Distress has worked with Greg a little bit in the past um, to provide big night kits um, for people to, to take out on big night. Um, but we're so excited to have him here tonight to share his knowledge. Um, and if you are, if you're unfamiliar with this series or haven't um, watched a webinar yet, this is a collaboration between Blue Hill Heritage Trust, um, a community conservation land trust on the coast of Maine for the Blue Hill Peninsula, and Island Heritage Trust, which is a land trust for Deer Isle, Stonington, and the surrounding islands. Uh, my name's Lander, and I'm the education coordinator. Um, and I'll let uh, Noelle introduce herself in just a second as well. Um, we're facilitating tonight. Um, we also have a huge archive of past webinars that if anyone in is interested in on a rainy day, going back and watching them, we've been doing this series since the beginning of the pandemic. So feel free to check those out and maybe I'll put a link in the chat box as well. Um, and all of our programs are free and open to the public. Um, and these webinars are recorded and people can watch them over and over again. If anyone is interested in supporting our work um, and, and you haven't, you're not familiar with that yet, feel free to check out our websites. Um, and if you already do support our work, thank you so much for doing that. Um, so I'll pass it over to Noelle now for a little tech, um, tech help, and then uh, we'll introduce Greg. Hi everyone, I'm Noelle. I'm the Outreach Manager at Island Heritage Trust. Um, we're so excited for this talk tonight. And if any questions come up throughout Greg's share, feel free to type your questions in the chat box. And at the end of the presentation with whatever time is left, we will field those questions and Greg will answer them for you. Awesome, thanks Noelle. Um, so we're so excited to have Greg. Oh, and Greg, I might not pronounce your last name right. Do you want to say it for us? Yeah, it's Leclerc. Okay, that, that's what I was going to say. So that's awesome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Greg Leclerc is a PhD student at the University of Maine, where he is developing genetic methods for monitoring rare wildlife. He is also the creator and coordinator of Maine Big Night, a community science project focused on gathering data on and protecting migrating amphibians in Maine. And tonight he's going to share about his work and about amphibians in general. Um, so, Greg, thank you so much for being here and we'll hand it over to you. Great. And thank you so much to both BHHT and IHT for hosting this and hosting me and also for interacting with this project several times over the past few years. So um, very excited to be talking to you all today. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start us all off where I started uh, about 20 years ago. So I'm going to introduce you to somebody here. Um, let's see. Yes, here we go. So this is me 20 years ago. I was about six or seven years old in these photos. And you're looking at a kid who already knew he wanted to be a wildlife biologist, which, you know, surprise, surprise, look at what this kid's doing. He's holding a snake and a coyote skull and reading about uh, gecko feet in a book. Um, he would rather be doing these things than being a normal kid like his twin brother in the background swinging a stick. <laughs> this is just who he was already. So you can imagine how this primed me for my first big night experience, which would be coming up in my sixth or seventh year of life. Um, and I'm going to put you in my shoes for that first experience. So um, I was unable to share audio, so maybe you'll be able to hear some spring peepers coming through my computer here, probably will come through a little bit spotty, uh, but what's more important is going to be what you see on the screen. Okay, so you probably heard some like kind of robotic sounding frogs coming through my speakers, which I apologize for, but hopefully you've all heard spring peepers before. Those are some of my favorite sounds in the world. It just, it sounds and it feels so triumphant after every winter. And that sound is what formed the backdrop for my first big night experience where my family and I were coming home from an outing. We we're pulling into our driveway. It's night, it's rainy, it's warm, it's April. We're walking to our front door. And then, then we saw this shadowy figure in our driveway. And that shadowy figure was a spotted salamander. Spotted salamanders are 
perhaps one of the greatest, just coolest looking animals we have here in Maine, and one that we don't get to see nearly enough because they spend most of their life underground. Um, and not just like, you know, a few inches below the surface, but actually pretty far underground. Sometimes you can roll a, a rock or a log and find one, but if you were like me, you were doing that all the time and don't really see these off, uh, all that often. I was used to finding the little redback salamanders and eastern newts that were a third of this size. So for this kid who already knew he wanted to be a wildlife biologist, to find the six or seven inch long black salamander with bright yellow spots was a really exciting experience. So I definitely took note of the fact that I saw this animal on a warm rainy night in April in my driveway and found that it was probably the right time to look for this animal again. Um, but I want to just take a, a quick pause and tell you just about how amazing spotted salamanders are uh, just by sharing one of the coolest facts about them, which is that spotted salamanders are one of the only photosynthetic, in fact, I believe they are the only photosynthetic vertebrate on the planet, which means that they can actually make food from sunlight like a plant can. Um, this is a really cool ability, but kind of an unfortunate one, because again, this animal spends almost enti its entire life underground, and it only comes up at night. So it, it really never interacts with the sun, except for when it's a tadpole, um, or the salamander version of a tadpole, which we just call a larvae, which that will help it grow faster and get more nutrients. But for the rest of its life, while it has that ability, will not be able to use it, but just super cool animal. And they weren't alone on these nights either. It didn't take long of me to search to find that uh, other species like the wood frog were also out hopping on these nights. Now wood frogs, well, they look pretty unsuspecting to most people. They're kind of just like essentially a, a leaf that learned how to croak. Um, they have these little cute black masks here that uh, we like to say is like really handsome. They look like they're going to the local ball. And in many ways, that's essentially what they're doing. They're going to breed just like all of the other amphibians on these nights. And these guys will actually form these large balls where they're all like climbing over each other and mating with each other. Um, and they're also the uh, farthest north extending amphibian in the world. They can be found in the Arctic Circle, and they owe that ability to the fact that they can freeze about 85% solid. Their heart will literally stop, and they can do that by just essentially filling their cells with what is basically urine and somehow survive that way through the winter and then come back as if nothing happened in the springtime. Um, and then on top of that, their croak sounds more like a little duck quack or a chicken cluck. So these guys are just uh, a wonderful little frog to encounter. And then there's the blue spotted salamanders, where these guys have some of the most complex genetic systems on the planet. I can't really even explain it very well, but what I can tell you is that their genomes are something like 10 times the size of ours, and that they're able to hybridize with a huge amount of other species just very readily. And they're able to do that with this lineage, a special lineage within blue spotted salamanders, where it's all female. They're replicating themselves, they're stealing genes from other species. Um, and pulling off this amazing genetics, um, uh, what's the word, uh, genetics gymnastics, <laughs> I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, just really wonderful species, and they are kind of rare here in the state. Um, I didn't actually see my first blue spotted salamander until I was probably 19, 20 years old. So um, if you haven't seen one, most Mainers haven't either, uh, but very pretty. They look like a, a starry night painting on their bellies if you were to flip them over. And then there's also the spring peepers, of course, right? We hear them everywhere, but I'd be interested to hear how many of you have actually seen one up close. They do end up on our windows very frequently in the summer as they try to chase the bugs around our lights. But um, during big night migrations, they are really hard to see because they look essentially like pebbles. Um, and then if you can hear them calling, I challenge you to try to find one that's calling because as you get within... 10 feet, maybe 30 feet, they're going to stop. And you're looking for the smallest frog in Maine that's also one of the best camouflaged. So um, I have only ever been able to see one or two spring peepers as they're calling. It's quite a quite a challenge to um, address. So there's also a dozen or so other species out there that will be moving around on these nights. And when all these guys are moving together on these warm, rainy, evenings in springtime, we get what's called a big night. So just to put it in words, a big night is a spring night when large simultaneous migrations of thousands of amphibians occur. 
um, you can get anywhere from in one spot from you know a dozen amphibians to some spots you could be in the thousands so these big nights happen not just once a year usually um, they typically happen three to five times every spring it can vary depending on the weather for sure and the amount will also influence how big the big night is so the less big nights you get the bigger they get so let's say weather conditions are only good for one movement in the year that is going to be a really big big night now amphibians are very sensitive to the environment around them which is why we get these big nights they need things to be really essentially like goldilocks conditions in order to feel safe to move so for example amphibians they can't produce their own body temperature they can barely regulate their own fluid, right? They have very super thin skin, so they can dry out very quickly. So they need things to be warm and they need things to be wet in order to feel safe moving. But a few other things also need to be in place. So for example, it needs to be springtime in Maine, which in Maine, uh, big night tends to be around mid-April, which as of last year, I think our biggest big night was April 15th, but usually it's around April 20th. And it does seem like it is trending a little bit earlier as climate change definitely marches on Maine's doorstep. Um, and then the ground needs to be thawed as well. This is a really good fail safe because we get those warm days, right? In February, January, December, where like for some reason it's like 50 degrees all of a sudden. If an amphibian took that as a hint that it's time to move, and oftentimes there are some that do take that hint, then they could be in big trouble the next day because the next day could be what? Like negative 20 degrees? So when the ground is thawed, that is a real indicator that not, not only is it warm, but things have been warm enough to actually thaw the ground out. That takes a lot of continuous heat energy to cause that to happen. And that usually means that springtime is here. Then it needs to be raining and it doesn't need to be a lot. It just needs to be enough to keep the ground wet so that the amphibians themselves are not drying out. And it needs to be about 45 degrees Fahrenheit or more to get a real good big night. We do get movements all the way down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but the lower you go, the less you're going to get and the higher you go, the more you're going to get. So if you get like a rainy night with like 50 something degree temperatures, those tend to be some really good migration nights. And to give you an idea of just how amazing these migrations are, um, wood frogs in particular, I mean, they're, they're traveling what seems like a small distance. It's something like 3000 feet to migrate, uh, to get from their, um, their wintering grounds to their uh, vernal pools where they're breeding. So, you know, in our minds, that's nothing too big. But if we compare the distance that these animals are migrating by their weight, we get some really amazing comparisons. So, for example, they're considered equal to the uh, woodland caribou migration up in the tundra, which is a 400 mile migration. It's considered 13 times greater than the wildebeest migrations in the Serengeti, which is probably one of the most famous migrations in the world of all time. Like, if you've ever seen a wildlife documentary, odds are pretty high that you've seen wildebeest like trying to cross a river and they're getting attacked by crocodiles and whatnot. That's the wildebeest migration of the Serengeti. And imagine something 13 times greater than that happening in your backyard under our noses every spring and like a, even if you live in the city somewhere you probably still have amphibians moving around i mean we've documented wood frogs that are actually breeding and moving through downtown south portland which is just amazing right so um again just to give you context a, a wood frog is moving about three thousand feet um a salamander it's usually more like a thousand feet but these guys can move quite a distance for their size in order to reach optimal breeding habitat now it didn't take long of following amphibians to realize that a lot of them are ending up like this bullfrog here and I, i'm gonna move past this slide so we don't have to look at this poor bullfrog um but essentially what i realized was that a lot of people can't see amphibians when they're driving and a lot of these guys are getting hit so over time uh, I've done some research about how roads impact amphibians, and I, I've boiled down a few important facts here for you. So first of all, just to give you some raw numbers, there was a really interesting study from Canada that uh, studied a single stretch of road over the course of four years and found that 30,000 amphibians had been hit over those four years, just that single stretch of road. Almost all of them were a single species, which is the northern leopard frog. Um, 
On average, a road crossing amphibian will be looking at somewhere around a 21% mortality rate. What that means is that there's a 21% chance that that amphibian is going to be hit by a car when it crosses. So one in five chance every time it crosses a road that it's going to be hit by a car. If somebody told me that uh, if I were to step outside and cross the street right in front of my house here, that there's a one in five chance that I'm going to be hit by a car, I'm not going to take those odds. I am going to go find a different road. So that is not a great set of odds to be working with. But that is just the average. There are some roads that can get up to 100% mortality rates. Just everything attempting to cross is getting hit. And that's because of the amount of traffic and sometimes how fast the traffic is moving. Um, so some roads are definitely worse than others. And then getting deeper, there is even evidence that there's so much pressure from roads that amphibians are not even able to reach each other to breed. So when you separate things for a long time, that's essentially how you make a new species. The genetics change, mutations happen, and like certain genes and alleles get like fixed in different populations. So we actually have evidence now that there are salamander and frog populations here in Maine on either side of the I-95 corridor uh, that are showing a uh, genetic difference from each other because they've been separated from each other for so long. <laughs> So fast forwarding now from my days in elementary school and getting into high school and early college, um, I'm taking friends and family out now with me to go look at these animals. And uh, I'm having a great time, of course, right? And especially getting other people involved. It's a lot of fun. We have like our spots that we like to go to and we're helping these guys cross roads as we can. But I'm also thinking in the back of my head, is there something more effective here? Because roads are everywhere and I can't be everywhere. Everyone that I'm with right now can't be everywhere to protect these amphibians. So what can we do in order to help these guys a little bit more? Because like, sure, we're, we're helping these individuals right now, but are we really increasing the overall uh, persistence capabilities of these populations? Like is helping just three spotted salamanders enough to help salamanders everywhere in Maine? Um, odds are probably not, but that led me to start this big night project where at the time it didn't even have a name. It didn't have any like real like future focus. It was just something that I wanted to give a shot. This was my senior year of college in 2018. Um, I was the president of what is called the Herpetology Club. So herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. And as the president of that club, I felt like I had finally, you know, gotten enough wherewithal and experience and I had been uh, doing herpetological field work as well for a few years. So um, with all that experience, I felt confident enough to try to put something together. So I gathered some friends, gathered some professors, and gathered a few faculty members from the college. And we decided to have our first big night outing where we had selected a few sites just around my college in Unity. Um, and we would go around and see just what we could do. We got like a few traffic cones and signage and flags and like we were really official looking, which was really cool feeling. So there was about a dozen of us in total. And we were able to actually attract the attention of, um, I don't know if anyone here would remember um, Bill Green's Maine. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm just getting over a head cold. So if you hear me sniffling, I do apologize. But um, so some of you do probably remember Bill Green's Maine. This was a show on New Center, Maine where he would highlight uh, a lot of like outdoor related stories and they caught wind of this and they came over and they're pretty excited about it, right? Like thinking we'd be swamped with frogs and salamanders because that's exactly what we sold them on, right? So we're hoping that we're gonna have like a really good big night for them. Um, so here's my actual, uh, actually my advisor, both then and now getting mic'd up and getting a, an interview with a camera. So like we're getting ready, but the problem was is I'm watching the weather on my phone and we were supposed to be getting rain by now and we weren't. And I'm looking at the radar and like the, the storm clouds are like going right around Unity, like as if there was this hole right in the Unity area. And like we were just getting missed by everything. Temperatures were dropping. We're getting into the 30s for temperatures. There's no rain. It's just like getting drier and drier. So, you know, I'm getting a little bummed out. And we start trying to search anyway, hoping that maybe there's going to be something to be seen. Uh, we keep searching and searching and searching when finally the rain actually starts and it's just a little pitter patter but it was enough to bring out a breeding male wood frog and that was the hail mary moment for this project we it without this wood frog i don't know if we would have gotten the gas to keep going because uh sure enough the cameras loved that wood frog this is him on the news center main website um and that gave us the wherewithal to keep going like we got film of the frog we got film of 
uh, people collecting data. We got more interviews. We're like our, our morale had overall boost, and we only helped one amphibian. We um, hadn't seen much for quite a, a time, and it, it took more rain to come down for us to start seeing more things. Like for example, uh, spring peepers started finally coming out. Uh, blue spotted salamanders as well started making an appearance and we got some great shots of volunteers helping these guys cross the road so we had gotten some really valuable shots that I think gave the project some good gas so overall 2018 was our first organized big night which was a success for us um, we had 49 amphibians recorded in total we surveyed four sites again only in the unity area around 12 volunteers um, and yes, unity area only. So not a big reach, pretty small start, but as far as we were concerned, we did it. Now, the problem is, is like I mentioned, that was my senior year at unity. So I was moving on and I had this idea of like, what now? Do I keep uh, trying to run things in unity or do I try to expand to a different area? Because I had kind of made a name for myself on this project. So like, it would be kind of weird to let go of it right now. Um, by the way, hopefully some of you recognize this guy in the striped shirt here. Um, that's Jeff Corwin. I got to meet him at our graduation. He was our speaker. So it was a real like come around moment for me. And I, I was telling him about the Big Night Project here as well as some of my work with turtles. But um, hopefully some of you know about Jeff Corwin. So anyway, I had this idea of like, okay, can I expand things a little bit? I had only moved 20 miles down the road to Waterville, but that was enough for me to think about a statewide project. And what you're looking at is the first map I put together, or one of the first maps I put together of potential big night sites around the state. But this wasn't a result of me like driving around and looking for spots or um, like scrolling around on Google Earth and being like, okay, like this spot looks good. I had to find a way to find these sites. And that relied on some ingenuity. Um, and how I did this basically was I was aware that there was this online database of significant wildlife habitats maintained by the state and a significant wildlife habitat includes vernal pools, which vernal pools are a significant breeding habitat for a lot of these amphibians. So within each of these circles is you can like kind of see like a little dark spot there um, is a vernal pool. And I used that state data to find all these locations where vernal pools were near roads and use that as an initial guide to figure out where to put sites. So this is Durham Road in Brunswick. And I all these little pink lines are sites that I made as a result of this data. So I've got like several on Moody Road and like four here on Durham Road and one on Christina Drive. So just try, trying to capture all these like places where amphibians might be moving. Maybe some of these spots would be good. Maybe some of them wouldn't, but this was a start. But I also did have a lot going on in my life at the time, and I needed to make sure that this project was going to be feasible, because even though I'm expanding statewide, like, it's just me. I don't have other people working for me. I don't have time to be focusing on, like, running a bunch of trainings or, like, telling everybody when to get out there or getting out there with everybody, because, first of all, I was uh, still a technician with state. I was doing turkey work. Um, that's me holding one of the turkeys that we captured back then in 2019. I also was raising my daughter, who uh, was a freshly born newborn, um, or actually hadn't even been born yet that spring, but um, that was something that was certainly up and coming. And then I was also becoming a, a grad student, which is what I'm doing now. So I had all these things like in the back of my mind, like, okay, I got to make sure this project can work with all three of these things, because my time is about to be very short. Um, so hopefully at some point I'd figure out some way to figure out how to squeeze Big Night in. And the way I figured to make that work was to make this a self-guided, almost like autonomous project where anybody could come in, get the information they need and like certify themselves, train themselves and get out there by their own means. So, uh, for example, volunteers train themselves, volunteers collect data whenever they can. I'm not like telling them like what days to go out and like that they have to go out on these days. Um, it's very like hands off. In a way, it's almost like um, eBird. If a lot of you use eBird, it's like this app where you can like submit data about the birds you see. Um, there's no rules about when you can go out and submit data. Um, it's like anytime, anywhere kind of thing. And granted, I have some more structure in place than that. Like you can't survey past May 15th or before March 15th. 
Um, but, you know, beyond those loose rules, it's really up to the volunteers to get the information when they can. And then there's other processes I figured I could automate too. So for example, submission of data, like rather than having people email me their data or uh, send me like paper copies and I enter it myself, why not have people enter it on their own or even make it easier where they fill out an online data submission form and it just gets entered as they fill out data. And then through that, we can even control the quality of the data, where if something doesn't look right, it will either contact the person and tell them that they need to fix something, or it will flag it for me and I can try to figure out what the problem was. So these automatic things were what would make it feasible for a single person to run, such as myself. Now, the other thing that was going to make this a lot easier was the fact that this could very easily be a community where people would support each other and bring their expertise to the table. Um, so, for example, social media has been a huge benefit to this project, Facebook in particular, we have a group um, where people can ask questions, get answers, get suggestions for equipment or like help with ID on certain species, um, even just sharing findings with each other has been a huge community builder. Um, then, of course, things like talks, right, it's bringing people into the project, um, but really the idea is about creating a an array of people that can provide different insights about things. One of, like, for example, perfect example. Um, we talk a little bit about how road salt affects amphibians, but it's something that I really don't know a whole lot about. And we'll talk in a little bit about how road salt has affected our project. And I presented this talk recently uh, where somebody in the audience happened to be kind of an expert on this stuff. And he's like giving me suggestions now about what I can do to help improve the road salt situation in Maine. So I gave you a little bit of a sneak peek of what's to come there. So pretend I didn't tell you that. But um, to summarize what happened in 2019, we recorded 376 amphibians, which is a pretty good jump from 49. We surveyed 18 sites, which uh, brought us statewide. So like not you know from York to like Presque Isle or something like that, but mostly along the coast. Um, again, better than just the four of the previous year. We trained 23 volunteers and established our statewide reach. So yeehaw. Um, the other important thing that we did do was set a charter for the project. Um, essentially these three goals that would guide the project for years to come. Number one was identifying a significant and vulnerable amphibian migration routes throughout the state. So where are amphibians getting hit? Um, where are there just large amounts of amphibians traveling over the roads? Things like that, identifying those. And then providing direct relief of road mortality on amphibians not only by helping them, like picking them up and like helping them cross roads, but also um, using our data to help guide future management practices, like installing salamander tunnels, for example. And then finally, we want to provide an opportunity for community members to participate in conservation and natural resource sciences. It's just, it's too good, right? Like it, this is a great way for people to get out there and not only interact with nature, but feel like they're having an impact, right? They're making a difference. So here comes 2020 and everything looks good until March when what happened in March of 2020? The COVID pandemic, right? This was kind of a, a nightmare come true in many different ways. And certainly in a community science project, I was left with thinking like, how am I gonna run a community science project when this might be the world we're about to be seeing? Like where we can't be next to each other. We can't really be a community. So what do we do? Um, as it turns out, this was actually a really perfect pandemic activity. So for example, it's outside, it was spaced out, we have relatively small groups participating, and everybody was looking for a way to get outside. So as a result, this happened to be like the perfect storm, I guess, to get more people involved in the project. Um, so we had an immense boost in volunteerism. And by the way, just like a fun story about getting off the ground in the pandemic. Um, we were, of course, like spinning tires and trying to figure out what's safe, what isn't, like what can we do, what can't we do. And I couldn't get answers from government on whether or not, you know, this would be a safe thing to do. Um, you know, a few police departments had expressed that in certain towns we couldn't uh, run this project and we respected that. But um, I had actually messaged the commissioner of IFW directly on Instagram <laughs> because I couldn't get through anybody else anywhere to get her blessing on this project for the pandemic. And she gave it to us and we roll it, uh, rolled with it. So um, thank you to uh, Commissioner Camuso for her blessing on that. But anyway, because of the pandemic, we had an immense boost in volunteerism. 
We got a huge boost as well in media coverage, thanks to one uh, volunteer who started in 2019, Brandon Keem. Uh, he's a nature writer and he pitched a story to the New York Times. And because of that, we got some incredible coverage. So uh, the CBC Radio, that's a Canadian radio company, The Atlantic, we got a big article in there as well. And of course, the New York Times, which is probably still one of our biggest articles to date. Um, and with that came to so many other accolades and uh, benefits to the project that we'll get into shortly. But the other really cool thing was that the pandemic gave us what is probably the greatest natural experiment opportunity of our time. Uh, more people sat still than perhaps at any other point in human history, at least in the past like 1000 years. So there were immense changes in how traffic operated and how emissions changed, how even noise occurred, things were a lot quieter. So a lot of us scientists were taking this as an opportunity to see how wildlife responded. And a lot of you probably heard stories about like birds singing louder or um, animals entering cities more, uh, all sorts of different examples, right? Um, as for this project, we noticed something really interesting, which is that there was an influence from the COVID pandemic on how many amphibians were getting killed. Uh, and that result was that there were about half as many dead on the road as other years. And this is both compared to before the pandemic and after. So sadly, traffic did pick back up um, shortly after the spring season, which um, a lot of people have been asking me, like, will there be more amphibians as a result of that decline in traffic? Uh, and the answer is probably not because of traffic returning to normal. Um, sure, there's probably more um, juveniles being born that year, but juveniles also need traffic to remain low when they exit the pools and, um, you know, transfer to local other forests and whatnot. So with traffic being back to normal levels by that summer, it's the odds are a little low that, um, there was a, a lasting benefit, but this would actually be the year that we would see an increase because uh, wood frogs would be at breeding age by now since then. And uh, this could be a first year of breeding for spotted salamanders as well. So if there is a signal there, it's cer certainly something that we might be able to pick on with um, 2023 data. Um, other interesting findings, by the way, from that same paper, since we're just looking at uh, how many amphibians were dying from the course of 2018 to 2021, um, we picked up a few other interesting notes that other people seemingly haven't noticed so far. First of all, that frogs get hit a lot more than salamanders when it's warmer. We don't know why. For just for some reason, like when it gets warmer, the amount of frogs getting hit increases, whereas salamanders, it stays the same. Doesn't matter how much warmer it gets. And the same is true about when it's raining more. So as the rain increases, the amount of frogs killed increases. But when the uh, rain increases for salamanders, again, it stays the same. So why that trend is, we don't know. We like gave it our best guesses, but really we, we still have no idea why that would be. So if anyone has any theories, please feel free to pitch them. Uh, but here's our summary of 2020. We recorded about 1,600 amphibians, so again, a big jump from just 300-something in the previous year. 69 sites surveyed around the state, 87 volunteers certified, and we gained national and international recon uh, recognition. We received financial gifts, which I'll tell you how we used that in just a second, and we published our first scientific publication. Now, coming into 2021, I was asking this question where community science projects are for everybody. So what if somebody can't participate? What if they can't afford their gear or can't um, access places to get gear or just maybe the gear is not available? Well, I decided to answer this question using some of the funding that we had received in the previous year. Uh, that was, by the way, thanks to the, um, the Moore Foundation and put together these kits where people could essentially check out anything from headlamps to clipboards to ID cards such as these ones here. Um, to vests, including child size vests, uh, data sheets, anything that you need to do in this project was available to be checked out for free. Um, and I sent these to places around the state. And uh, by the way, if you want either of these ID cards, these are uh, full life size um, drawings by Michael Boardman. And he's a, a fantastic wildlife artist based out of, I believe, Yarmouth. Uh, these are out of stock last I checked, but um, put some pressure on them to restock them because these things are cool. And they're also waterproof, by the way, so you can bring them out with you on your big night adventures. 
They include every main amphibian except for one. That one that we could not fit on here was the mink frog, which is a frog that you are extremely unlikely to encounter during this project. Um, and of course, I ate my words the first year that we produced these. Somebody found a, a stinking mink frog. <laughs> um, so uh, hopefully most of you won't encounter a mink frog and won't be confused as to why it's not on there. But these are really cool and hopefully they are available soon. And I believe it's half of the proceeds from that go to the project. So uh, please consider buying them once they do come back in stock. And by the way, that's also a way we used our money was to commission these ID cards. Um, by the way, this map just shows you the places around the state where you can check out equipment. So um, I believe BHHT is this one up here. So if you want to check out some equipment, you should um, check it out there. But hopefully, no matter where you are in the state, you will be able to find somebody nearby that can give you equipment. The only places that I'm looking to find people to host are Bangor and Augusta or Waterville area, which I guess I, I live in Waterville. I could probably be an equipment host myself now that I think about it. But um, until we get greater uh, greater volunteer interest in the county, I'm not really concentrating on putting kits up there. But um, if anybody is associated with anybody up in the county and would be interested in hosting kits, please let me know. I am out of funding for producing the kits at the moment, but I can certainly tell you everything that we use for them and they're very low cost to put together. So. Um, you can put together enough kits for you know five or six people for under a hundred dollars very easily. So just let me know if you're interested, and I'm happy to help set you up. Another very interesting thing has been our ability to keep our finger on changes in the world of amphibians. And I'm showing you these two pictures because initially, when we first found these guys, we were very excited. We're like, wow, these are like the most pregnant female frogs we've ever seen in our lives. They've got more eggs in them than you would believe. As it turns out, these are de diseased animals and they're diseased by road salt. So as I had mentioned earlier, road salt is something we're kind of keeping an eye on because this is what it does to frogs. It takes away their ability to regulate water in their own bodies. Um, it is essentially affecting their kidneys and they can't regulate correctly. So um, they balloon up and they're not able to move appropriately. They're not able to mate. They're not able to escape predators. So this could be a problem, right? And I'm sure it's also painful. I mean, it just doesn't look healthy. Um, and we didn't know this until a paper came out in 2020 or 2021 describing this disease. And we're like, oh my gosh, like we've been seeing this now for a year or two. Um, and it was only described in wood frogs. As far as we know, nobody has described this in spring peepers yet, like the one on the left. So as far as we know, we're the only people to have ever reported a spring peeper with this. Uh, it's, a, it's a form of edema. Um, so we've been keeping an eye on this and where it's happening. Um, if you ever do see this, please take a photo and submit it to us and tell us the location. But it seems like there are certain hot spots throughout the state, uh, particularly in places that are um, developing communities that are still like on the edge of large rural areas where a lot of amphibians still exist. So, for example, uh, Camden and Gray are two towns that we have seen this more than other towns. Um, so again, please, if you see any of this, let us know, send some photos, and we'd be happy to help document it. So to summarize 2021, we recorded 5,700 amphibians, so getting even more every year. 185 sites surveyed around the state, 316 volunteers certified, participation kits distributed around the state. We hired an intern. That was another way that we used our money. We were able to get an intern and give them a really decent um stipend for their work doing mapping for us. We commissioned the custom ID cards. We are tracking that new edema disease. We got additional media coverage, including NPR, which if you're an NPR nerd like me, we were on All Things Considered with Ari Shapiro. Uh, that was a, a huge moment for me just to hear my work uh, coming out of that man's mouth. It was really exciting. Um, so coming into 22 last year, Maine Big Night is now five years old. So this is kind of like a midlife crisis moment for a lot of long-term projects where after you reach five years, you're kind of like, okay, what are we doing? Are we doing what we initially set out to uh, achieve? So I reviewed our initial goals. So first of all, are we helping amphibians cross the road? Yeah, we're doing that every year. Are we getting people participating in natural resource sciences? Yeah, totally. Are we identifying the conservation priority areas? That is... I hadn't felt we had really done yet. We had done a few really simple analyses before where we had pinpointed a few roads that seemed like they're particularly deadly, but we had really never 
um, established what roads were in the greatest need and communicated that to the people that need to know it. So the important reason to do this is because the sites that we find need it most will hopefully get something that looks like this, which are under road crossing structures. Uh, you can call these salamander tunnels or frog tunnels or, uh, I mean, these can be for almost any wildlife species that are small enough to fit in. It could be a turtle tunnel, it could be a mink tunnel, whatever you want it to be. Um, but hopefully based on our data, we can find places that deserve these things. And it would be great if we could give all 501 sites uh, one of these salamander tunnels, but the sad part is, is that these will cost anywhere from a half million to a million dollars each, uh, mostly just paying people to put these things in. The materials themselves are actually pretty cheap, uh, but we need to be careful and smart about where we put these things. So how do we decide where sites, uh, which sites will get tunnels? Um, first of all, like I mentioned, we did some like really rudimentary analysis to figure out like what are the deadliest roads that we currently have? So first of all, Boyd's Corner Road in South Berwick has 60% mortality. That's pretty high. Um, Durham Road in Brunswick, 64%. Center Road in Gray, 65%. Thorndike Road in Unity, 70%. Forest Avenue, 70% as well. So we have these like top five sites that we were like keeping our eye on. But does anything else matter? Like is mortality rate the only thing that we should really be considering? How about whether or not there are any rare species present, like the blue spotted salamander or the northern leopard frog? Both are of concern in the state. How about the spring salamander? That is probably one of the least seen amphibians in the state, but it's also certainly one of the coolest. Like, do we care about protecting those species? How many amphibians are actually being seen there? What if somebody went and surveyed a site and they only found one frog and it was dead? That site technically has a 100% mortality rate. So, how do we handle information like that? Um, is the population likely to exist long-term with or without help? This is probably one of the hardest questions to answer for conservation biologists such as myself and others where we need to evaluate like who's gonna make it and how. Um, like, will they persist if we don't do anything? If so, then they probably shouldn't get a tunnel. Will they persist if we give them a tunnel? If the answer is yes, then we should probably give them a tunnel. If the answer is no, then it's probably going to be hard to save that population and they're going to need more. Um, and then the debate comes of like, okay, do we try to save that population? Do we like, is there anything else that we have to put into it? And it really becomes like deeply philosophical. Like, who do we save? You know, it's like the the two like railroad track problem. Um, like, who do we send the, the train to run over, right? Um, and then we need to consider whether or not the sites are being surveyed enough to be confident because a lot of people go and survey their sites for only like 10 minutes or so at a time. And sometimes that's all the survey that happens in a year. So do we wanna rely on 10 minutes of data or do we wanna put more weight on sites that have received hours of data? So using all that information, we've identified sites throughout the state. And before I show you what sites those are, I want to give you this map to keep the gears turning a little bit more. This is a map I made just a few days ago based on our 2022 data where um, the size of the circle is the amount of amphibians seen at that site, and the color of the circle is how many were found dead. So you can probably pick out a few patterns already. So uh, by the way, the, the redder the circle, the more that were found dead there. So you can see like in the southern end of the state, a lot of small circles and a lot of red ones. So small populations, and a lot of them are getting hit. So southern end of the state might already be in dire straits where putting a tunnel in might not help anything. There might not be enough amphibians to support themselves anymore. Um, they might not be able to make it. Like if we put a tunnel in there, they're still facing threats from all the other roads around them. So is that one of those places we might just have to let go? Like it's a really sad thought to think about and hopefully it, it doesn't come to that. Maybe there's something we can actually do. Uh, but compare that to a place like up in the Bangor Orono area where you're getting like large populations of amphibians, but really a lot of them are getting killed right now. So, what about those spots? They have high populations, but a lot of them are getting killed right now. That sounds to me like a really prime spot to put a tunnel because they have the population size to maintain themselves if a tunnel is put in. Um, so crunching all the data that I had mentioned earlier, uh, we identified 30 sites around the state, and thankfully we do have a good number of them in the southern end of the state where 
tunnels should be placed. This is based on data uh, cumulatively from 2018 to 2022, and we delivered that data to the Maine Department of Transportation, as well as Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and Maine Audubon so that we can like get like a task force moving on this. There is funding out there for projects like these, including the 2021 um, infrastructure bill that Congress had passed, and that included something like $35 million just for wildlife crossings. So that's money that we should be getting into to try to help uh, these amphibians as well as other wildlife species, because again, um, whatever we put in for a tunnel is almost certainly going to be effective for other species as well. It doesn't have to be just a frog or salamander tunnel. It could be for turtles. It could be for you know any other rare or um, strange species in that area. So uh, to sum up 2022, we recorded 8,500 amphibians, 246 sites surveyed, 361 volunteers certified, and identified the top 30 sites for tunnel placement. And we also did a really cool thing, which was the integration of an app for collecting data. So I mentioned this a little bit before, but this is part of like the um, steps towards making this more and more automatic, uh, like an autonomous, like self-running project. Um, you can now download a page on your phone where you can like submit data directly and like you don't have to like type it up on your computer after anymore. You can just like record it all right there on your phone and hit submit and it goes right to us. Um, all like data controlled and everything. So it's been an awesome part of the project has been having that app included. So to total up all of the previous five years and now we're going into our sixth year. So I'm excited to see these numbers jump even more. The previous five years, we have counted 16,000 amphibians. About a third of those would be dead, so about two thirds of those alive. So around like 10, 11,000 of those are alive and about 5,000 of those are dead. Um, we have about 2,000 cumulative hours of survey time, which pans out to 91 straight days of survey time, which is just amazing. We have had 318 unique sites surveyed around the state, including every at least one in every county, um, if you look all the way into the northern tip of Maine, we finally had somebody in a rustic survey for us up in St. Agatha. Um, that was so cool to get that data. But I mean, we've got everything from Loop Beck down to Kittery, getting up into the western Maine mountains, um, even like up into like the Katahdin region, which is just so exciting to see how much this project has grown. And then we don't have a good estimate of how many people have actually participated in this project because um, sometimes people don't record who else comes out with them on these big nights. But theoretically, most people are bringing at least one other person with them. Some people are bringing five, some are bringing 20. So we're estimating just broadly thousands of people have now participated in this project. I would love to have a more concrete number, but I mean, just every year there's so many people participating and more people every year too. And now that's becoming a, a more social event, like people are serving with each other, they're bringing friends and family out, they're realizing just like how fun this is with others. Um, more and more people are participating every year. So what's next for the project? This is just a little bit of a ramble for you to give you an idea of what directions might be coming, but um, we are, of course, interested in doing research. So we want to figure out what predicts wildlife road mortality. Um, we want to know the social influences of the project. How is this project changing how people feel about nature or science or um, anything along those lines? Yeah. Amphibian diseases. So anything like the road salt to the other diseases that amphibians are facing, like chytrid fungus and ronavirus. Um, are we able to use this project to monitor those as well? How are amphibian populations doing? Are they stable in Maine? Are there places in Maine where they're definitely declining? And what's the what's the timeline on those? Like, how do we have time to save a lot of these populations? How reliable is our data? So for example, we have um, a collaborator from the University of New England, Dr. Jeff Parmley, who's gonna be leading a project soon to figure out how accurate our counts are. So think if you're out counting amphibians on a big night, um, Dead ones don't move, so you're more likely to find a dead one, whereas living ones, they're moving, so they might like evade you and you might not see them. So are we getting accurate counts of these amphibians or things uh, biased in a certain direction? His, uh, his research is going to focus on um, how biased we are and if we are some corrections that we can make to our data to be a more reliable data source. Um, we also want to conduct targeted surveys to assess rare species, especially the spring salamander. So if you happen to live in the mountainous area of the state where spring salamanders live, 
Um, I would love to find sites near you where you can go see if spring salamanders are being affected by roads. We know they go on roads now, and that's a question that we had until very recently. Like last year, um, we hadn't seen a spring salamander on the road until last spring. So um, it's really new information to know <laughs> that they actually go on roads during big nights. Now we just need to know how affected they are. And of course, we're going to continue our annual surveys. We're going to continue increasing access to the project. But I want to know also what you would like to see. So if you have any comments or ideas, please feel free to throw those in. I would love to hear uh, your ideas. I mean, after all, this is a community science project. So that is everything that I have to share with you today. I just really want to thank everybody for being here and for um, showing interest in this project. For this to come this far around from that kid who was seven years old finding a salamander in his driveway to last year finding 8,000 amphibians and you know producing a scientifically uh, peer-reviewed article in the New York Times and like all these other things that are coming together. It's just been such an honor. So thank you everybody for the attention and for your time and for doing what you do for amphibians. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to direct them to my contact information here. Um, also check out our website, check out our Facebook and our Twitter. Twitter, um, and then I have so many other people to acknowledge as well. I'll just leave it at that, but um, please feel free to shoot questions into the chat as well. So thank you. Wow, Greg, thank you so much. That is so inspiring to see how your work has grown over time and the impacts that it's had. And you're an incredible storyteller, the way you entwine, intertwine your story and the amphibian story and just show that interconnectedness between all of us, a beautiful example. Of thank that. you so much. So, first of all, just thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing that story. Yeah, thank you. And I think we did have some questions here and some um, thanks in the chat box as well. Great. Is it helpful for us to read off the questions for you, Greg? Yeah, yeah, if that's the easiest way to go about it, that works for me. Do you want to take one, Noel, first? Or? Yeah, sure. One came in a while ago <clears throat> from Cheryl, thanking you for an outstanding presentation. Congratulations on your excellent work. When you place a tunnel, how do you determine whether the amphibians will use the tunnel? Mm, that's one of the hardest parts of wildlife road crossing infrastructure so far is like guaranteeing that it's going to be used. Um, there's a almost like hilariously bad example of a huge overpass being made where it's a bridge going over a highway for animals. So it's like a bridge with like trees and grass and rocks on it. And um, the folks who had set that up put some cameras out to you know see what was using it. And over the course of something like five years, a single squirrel used it. So that's something that was probably a multi-million dollar project. So it really takes some really careful attention to make sure that these are effective. Uh, luckily for amphibians, they can be effective pretty easily. All you got to do is set up a fence of some sort that they can't cross um, and use it to funnel them to the entrance of that tunnel. Um, so it could be literally just like a tarp or it could be a concrete wall, just something that like has a good spread that will like direct them to the mouth of that tunnel. Thank you. So there's another one here. Um, amphibious critters are very vulnerable to pesticides. Any data near fields or suburban lawns with herbicides that you know of? Um, I don't have any direct data relating to pesticides, but I mean, it is very well known that uh, pesticides do affect amphibians very easily, again, because of their very thin permeable skin, they'll absorb that quite readily. Um, so we don't have any data related to pesticides yet, but certainly the road salt for sure. Yeah, thank you. And I forget too what pesticides are particularly harmful. I want to say it's like atrazine or something like that, but I, I know nothing about pesticides. Nobody quote me. Nobody even tell anybody what I just said for a pesticide. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> Asia um, wanted to let everyone know that the ID cards from Coyote Graphics are back in stock. Yes, and she was right. and she was curious what the name of the app is that you mentioned, Greg. Yeah, so the app is uh, Survey123. And the way you so Survey123 is like a, a very general survey data form app. Um, so you got to get the uh, app either as an app itself on your phone, or you can actually just like pull it up on like your uh, browser on your phones, like Safari or Google. And then 
um, download the page and it actually just bookmark the page to your phone. And then it functions just like an app. So um, if you look in our 2023 training manual, there is directions in there on how to do it for Androids and for iPhones. So you can get it downloaded right to your phone and just while you're out surveying, you get to just plug away numbers. It's also really nice too, because uh, it doesn't get wet like a data sheet does. The data sheets will just get soggy and really hard to write on, whereas your phone, you just got to dry it off every now and then. So um, highly recommend. Awesome. That's so good to know. Um, so we have a bunch of people thanking you and saying it's so interesting and informative and great presentation. And then someone has a question. Um, actually, we have a few more just popping in here, but um, from May, um, is there something we can do to help the diseased amphibians take them to a wildlife rehabber, rinse them off with clean water, et cetera? She said she's guessing maybe not, but she thought she would ask. Yeah. So I'm not currently aware of what the best practice is for those, but given the fact that it's a problem resulting from them being in water that's too high in salt concentrations, probably the opposite would be what would help. I'm not positive, but uh, putting them in water that is, um, and this is going back to like biology classes, like with tonicity, right? Like isotonic and hypotonic and hypertonic, like you would have to have something that was like less of a salt concentration than the amphibian was to try to get that like liquid out. But I don't know that, you know, that's the safe way to do it because you could end up damaging their kidneys. So um, that is just a guess. But if I do hear of anything, I'll certainly let everybody know. Thank you. Do we have time for more or should we stop there? I still have time personally. But all right, well, we have, I think, two more questions. Annie said, do you see any possibility of regulation resulting from studies of how road salt affects amphibians and other species? Yeah, almost certainly. Um, there already have been a few changes made to some towns based on how they you know, release salt or when they release salt. Uh, because of how it affects amphibians and other wildlife species. And a lot of that's been voluntary adoption, but um, you know, with studies like these coming out, it's possible that it, it could become more uh, law or policy related and not just like voluntarily adopting these things. So it looks like we have one more question to finish up here. Um, on MDI, I have seen homemade signs, um, warning of turtle crossings. Can we consider a mm -hmm. similar signs to warn drivers of amphibian crossings in high mortality areas? Absolutely. And that's definitely been something on our radar. In fact, we're thinking about trying to design these like solar powered uh, traffic signs with main DOT where like lights would be blinking on these nights, like they you know have some sort of connection to cellular data so we can like activate these things and get people aware when things are moving. Uh, but homemade science, absolutely. Like that stuff is so cool. I, I've seen the homemade ones on MDI and elsewhere. And I think that's just so beneficial to whatever is going there. I mean, it to see not only that sign and get you thinking about it, like, but like, oh, like the people here care enough about it too. Like that's another layer of uh, being careful. So highly recommend that too. Um, one more just popped in, might as okay. well read it and then we can be done. May asks also about signs. Are we allowed to put up road signs leading up to the sites we're surveying? We're surveying. Yeah. Does DOT have any restrictions? As far as I'm aware, you can put like small scale signs that as long as they don't affect the actual flow of traffic, you're okay. Um, so like you can't tell people to stop or like divert to different roads. Uh, but you can be like warning, like amphibian crossing ahead or like even, you know, road work ahead, like that kind of stuff that draws attention and like gets people to slow down. Um, as far as I know, that's okay. Wonderful. Thank you, yeah. Greg. Yeah. Lander, that you. makes me think that that could be a fun thing for land trusts to do is host like a sign making event, yeah. you know, before big night. Oh, that would be really cool. Yeah. And working with kids too, getting classes to join in, or it would be wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I have a lot, of, yeah. a lot of ideas spinning around. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg. We really appreciate your time and hearing your story tonight.
Yeah, thank you so much for hosting me, and I, I hope to see a lot of you out there. Thank you, Greg. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.